Thank you, MSU Mississippi. That was wonderful. Welcome, everyone today and so happy that the weather has cooperated please gather around I believe there might be a seat or two left um, we are ready to begin and at this time I would like to invite Brooklyn Neff president of our Northeastern State Student Government Association to the podium Hello everyone, as Dr. Landry, Dr. Landry introduced, I am Brooklyn Neff and I'm the current president of our Northeastern Student Government Association. It's an honor to be with you all today and I would like to welcome you to our beautiful campus. Thank you so much again, we, I cannot express how much. It's an honor to be with you on the unveiling and dedication on, of this monument. It's been an occasion that we have been eagerly awaiting for, and as you will hear from previous speakers after me, you'll see that we have put so much thought and effort into this day. As a student, I would like to say that I very much appreciate being a part of the campus that is so dedicated to supporting our students, those who are serving and who have served. At this time, I would like to invite you all into a moment of silence for past students who have served and current students who are serving in our armed services. Thank you all so much. As mentioned, my role as, a, as president of the Student Government Association, I am in charge of different student leaders across campus. One thing they felt so strongly about was honoring our students who are serving and have served. They indeed passed the legislation to demonstrate this fact. Thank you all again, and I appreciate the remarks and everything that have come together to form this day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brooklyn. At this time, I would like to ask you to stand if you're able to stand as we post the colors and sing the national anthem.
Thank you. If you remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, please be seated. I wanna thank our musicians and those from the ROTC Army Color Guard that were here this morning, Lizzie Franklin, our vocalist, our color guard cadets, Lance Holcomb, Samuel Walkingstick, Jordan Carlack, Brandon Savage, Connor Suda, our NSU trumpet ensemble, Trevor Gray, Aiden Hansen, Parker McElwain, Gavin Strickland, Jackson Washburn, led by and directed by Dr. Benjamin Hay. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. At this time, I would like to welcome to the stage our 19th president of Northeastern State University, President Steve Turner. Thank you, Dr. Landry. Good morning and welcome to Northeastern State University. On behalf of all of the NSU family, thank you to our veterans, to uh, those of you that have served or are serving. We are so glad that you're here. I do have, we have several guests, and so if you'll be patient, I will go as quickly as possible. But one of the things that we didn't say in the beginning is that Dr. Landry, who is our provost and kind of the MC today, is also a retired Marine. So Dr. Landry, also for your service, thank you so much to all of our veterans. There are some other folks that will have a speaking role that will be introduced a little bit later in the program, but now let me introduce some special guests. First, uh, my special guest always, my wife, Penny. So, Penny, welcome. We're glad that you're here. We're very fortunate today to have all of the members of our governing board, a constitutionally created board, from all parts of the state. Uh, you will hear from one of the uh, regents in just a moment, but let me go through the list and I'll go through the list, ask them to stand and we'll applaud for them as a group. We have the chair uh, and regent Connie Riley from Okima. We have Regent Gary Parker and fortunately his wife Carol is with him today, Gary, Carol. We have Regent Chris Vandehan and his wife Debbie from Tulsa. By the way, Gary and Carol are from Muskogee and both NSU alums. Thank you. We have Regent Lake Carpenter from Leedy, Oklahoma, out in Western Oklahoma. We have Jane McDermott, Regent Derp from Alva. Good to have you. Regent Amy Ann Ford from Durant. Regent Eric Fisher from Edmond. State Superintendent and Regent Joy Hoffmeister. Oh, good to see you. Is, now those are the regents. We also have a couple of folks. Sheridan, are you here? There's Sheridan McCaffrey, the executive director, and I know so the general counsel for Russo, Deborah Lyon, is here. Let's say thank you and welcome to our uh, representatives from Russo. Thank you all for being here. I have to point out also that you're going to see that the monument sits on a marble base, and that was because of a wonderful discussion that occurred. I believe we were in Alva. Eric Fisher brought that up, and uh, I think it's it, it, it makes it visually stunning so great suggestion and we appreciate uh, the donors that made that happen we do have uh, senator john haste uh, from district 36 for broken arrow senator haste good to see you today i is representative culver here i cannot see everyone in the back yeah there we go district four representative bob ed culver good to see you today and we're supposed to have District 12 Representative Kevin McDougal. Kevin, are you here? Maybe not. He may be stuck in the parade traffic, so it's okay. 
We have the mayor of the city of Tahlequah, a good friend to NSU and to the community, Mayor Sue Catron. Mayor, where are you? There she is over here to my right. Chief Bunch of the UKB, did you make it? Okay, we'll move along. We have some of my friends and colleagues, the other presidents of the Regional University System of Oklahoma. There are six institutions, uh, including NSU. Four of the other presidents are here with their business officers. So let me call them. We have the president of UCO, President Heidi Newhold Ravikumar. We have the president of Northwestern Oklahoma State University in Alva, Janet Cunningham. The president of Southeastern Oklahoma State University in Durant, Thomas Newsom. And, and the president of Southwestern Oklahoma State University in Weatherford, Dr. Diana Lovell. Presidents, would you wave and let's say welcome and to your business officers. Thank you for being with us today. We're glad they're here, but they also came because this afternoon we start committee and board meetings. So we, we appreciate, let me just say quickly, I appreciate the, the regents for moving the meeting, the April meeting here, not only to support our veterans, but for the first time in, in my 10 years of being here, you've actually get to see the campus in the fall and all the beautiful colors. So thank you for doing that. We have a special group of folks that I, I just appreciate so much. There's two groups beyond those. One is the Veterans Monument Committee that has worked tirelessly to bring uh, today together. And then we have those that made it happen with their generous contributions. I'm gonna start with the Monument Committee. This is the committee that I appointed in the summer of 2018. They began their work uh, in, in a big way in August. And through their work, they interviewed 11 different artists. We submitted an RFQ, uh, several artists responded. They took the 11 down to three and they ultimately made a recommendation to select Joel Randall from those interviews. This is a group that also turned many sites on the campus here in Tahlequah and made the recommendation to the cabinet to, for this to be the location of the monument. I can't think of a better place for it to be uh, adjacent to historic seminary hall and every, a wonderful reminder of what the Cherokee Nation does and as it looks to the east. So thank you to the committee. They include Mr. S. Joe Crittenden, former deputy chief, now current Secretary of Veterans Affairs for the Cherokee Nation. Secretary Crittenden, where are you? There he is. Also, uh, he's a good Navy guy. Secretary, thank you for your service. Uh, Mr. Tony Oslin. I don't know if Tony, someone in my staff, did Tony make it? Tony has some severe uh, uh, disabilities, and so, but Tony is a Navy. He represented the veterans community, did a phenomenal job. Zachary Neal was a Marine, he's our student. He couldn't be here today because now he's in graduate college over in Arkansas. But Zachary did a great job. You've already been introduced to Dr. Debbie Landry, our, our resident Marine. We have Dr. Roy Wood, who represents the branch campuses. He's also a Navy guy. Dr. Wood, I saw you somewhere, where are you? There he is in the back, all dressed up, uniform looks great. We have representing our faculty, someone I've known a long time, good friend, Dr. Condessa Teehee. Condessa, I see her over here. Thank you for your work. And then also, Chris, yes, thank you. And Christy Lansaw, who is over facilities and construction, she represented that area way back here, VP of Administration and Finance. Now I want to mention the donors. We, the committee started its work in 2018, and then ultimately, uh, on Veterans Day 2019, we made the announcement, the prototype was constructed, we shared that, and within eight days of making the announcement that we were going to construct this amazing monument, the donors stepped up and funded all parts of it within eight working days. The first, the lead gift to step up that day uh, with, at, at the encouragement of S. Joe Crittenden and then Chief Baker followed by Chief Hoskin was the Cherokee Nation. Thank you to the Cherokee Nation. The natural gas provider in this region of the state is provided by Northeast Oklahoma Public Facilities Authority. We have representing that our executive director, Mr. Jim Reagan. Jim, where are you? Thank you, Jim. Thank you to the mayors of the communities that we serve. 
We have two alums that have a real heart and passion for the veterans, uh, have served their families, Gary and Carol Parker. Gary and Carol, thank you both for helping us with this. The electric provider for Tahlequah is the Grand River Dam Authority uh, through Tahlequah Public Works, but we have their CEO, NSU alum, foundation board member, Mr. Dan Sullivan, and his dad, Frank. So Dan, thank you. Great job, good to see you today, Frank. We were able to participate in a new grant initiative that was sometimes a, a luck is better than being smart, but we got lucky, JD. The Telequal Community Fund put out a solicitation and you had to have a match. And so we needed money for the plaza. The foundation had stepped up with the match, but we needed the other part. So we've responded to the solicitation and the Tahlequah Community Fund uh, helped us with this beautiful plaza. J.D. Carey and his wife Karen are here and J.D. Worth, Jodine Worth are here representing the Tahlequah Community Fund. Thank you all, they're back here. Great job. Northeastern Oklahoma Community Health Centers has facilities throughout the region, including one on our campus. We stepped up uh, in working with Scott Rosenthal. Scott could not be here today, but he has Mr. Mike McGavick. Mike, where are you? Thank you so much to Northeastern Family Health Centers. A community partner in so many ways, and, and interestingly, I just noticed that our friend has announced his retirement. But uh, we had some meetings with the Lake Region Electric Cooperative. They do a phenomenal job with uh, high-speed internet, they were a great partner in February. They've been a great partner in the community. They stepped up through their foundation. Mr. Hamid Vadapur is here, so Hamid, good to see you today. And congratulations on your retirement. Thank you for what you've done. We have the NSU Alumni Association. We're all the, if you're an alum of NSU, wave your hand and make some noise. Yeah, there we go. We have representing all of you, the chair, Dr. John Cox. John, I saw you, where are you? Over here, thank you, thank you for. The NSU Foundation uh, also was one of the early groups to meet the challenge, and sorry about that wind noise. There are several members of the foundation here, but you know, I'm so pleased that uh, in these last 10 years, we've, through their leadership and investment and a lot of very generous people, our foundation has grown from $16 million in assets now to almost 45 million. And they stepped up and made a big contribution to this. So would all of the NSU Foundation members please stand and let us recognize you. Yeah, I see former Speaker A there. All of you, thank you, Foundation Board members. And we have a, a longtime uh, friend of the institution, an, an alum who's not able to be here, but Mr. Daryl Sullinger, Sully, made a significant contribution that will help protect and maintain this monument for decades to come. So uh, Sully is, is uh, an older gentleman. He's had some health problems, he's doing better, but we miss him. If he were here, he would probably already be in tears. So, uh, but Daryl Sullinger, thank you, Sully. I'm almost finished. We do have the vice presidents who work and touch every major initiative here. Uh, they work tirelessly to promote the institution and support students. You've met Dr. Landry. We have the Vice President of Student Affairs, Dr. Jared Freeman. Dr. Freeman, just way, where are you? We have Dan Mabry, who probably uh, you met earlier as he was getting folks in, and I've already introduced Christy Lansall. So thanks again to the cabinet. There's a group of gentlemen somewhere behind me, or they were. None of this would happen. Certainly we had uh, a lot of folks, but there's always those in our facilities, grounds, uh, getting, making sure the sod's out. This is all new, making sure the elevations, but they're led by our interim facilities director, Harold McMillan. I don't want to mention someone because I might miss someone, but let's, let's give a big round of applause to Harold and all the crews from facilities and grounds for making it happen. We had Auxiliary Services, Chris Adney is here to make sure the tents, the sound, a lot of folks you can imagine. So if you had any part in today, thank you for what you've contributed. 
There are some contractors that helped us, or they worked with the artist Joel Randall. We have Art, ART LLC, Metal Dynamics, Rico Construction, and Brett Rogers, Studio 45 Architects, Marcus Fairless, Zach Summers, Synapse, and the Crucible LLC. So thank you for your role today. Let's applaud them. Let me transition now to my comments about the day. Uh, again, we are so glad that you're here. The barrage of gunfire on the western front of World War I continued right up until the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. At the agreed upon time, the armistice ended all fighting on the land, sea, and air. A year later, President Woodrow Wilson signed a proclamation declaring November 11 as Armistice Day. Under Public Law 380, November 11 is designated as the day we observe Veterans Day. Now for 103 years, this special, day, this special day is set aside to honor the brave men and women who have served in peace or in war and in all branches of the armed services. One more time, let's say thank you to all the veterans. To help you appreciate a little bit of why this monument is necessary, in fact, this is re replaces a monument, and I'll share a little bit of that in my comments, but I want to share a snapshot of a little bit from World War I, World War II, and Vietnam. On April 6, 1917, President Woodrow Wilson signed a proclamation of a war against Germany taking the United States into the Great War. The impact of the American entry in the conflict was felt immediately at Northeastern. Enrollment in the 19, 1917 summer session fell by 76 as men volunteered for military service. Co-eds had always outnumbered males at NSU since the school's opening, but in the 1917-1918 academic year, of a total of 331 students in the regular terms, only 96 were male. The ratio was even more skewed in the summer terms with 161 men and 522 women, in 1917 and 74 men and 533 women the next summer. By the beginning of the spring term on Monday, March 4, 1918, the impact of the American involvement in the European war had become more apparent on Northeastern's campus. Not only was the enrollment of male students down, but all institutions, including schools, were expected to contribute to the war effort. The Northeastern Normal developed special free courses open to everyone in food conservation and dietetics. Lectures were brought to campus to discuss war activities and encourage the students and the public to do their bit. The local newspaper noted, the war gardens at Northeastern Normal are growing rapidly. Students and faculty in the art department crafted a banner with an American Eagle reminding viewers, the wheat and meat we do not eat may save the great cause from defeat. Your bit may win the war. On May 13, 1918, look with me if you will to my right. Not the gymnasium, but just beyond it, attached to it, is an auditorium that was dedicated on May 3, 1918. Sadly, its first public event was in mid-September when the faculty and students joined with the residents of the town for a funeral service for First Lieutenant George R. Anderson. The former Northeastern coach and science instructor had been killed in combat at the Battle of Chateau Thierry in France on July 22, 1918. World War II. The 1942 spring semester, 656 students enrolled at Northeastern, 188 fewer than the fall semester. Normally, the students, the number of students attending colleges in Oklahoma dropped from 5 to 10 percent between the fall and the spring semester. With the country at war, Northeastern State lost 22 percent of its students. In the spring 1944 semester, students and the Industrial Arts Department completed a plaque containing the names of former, former Northeastern students and graduates report killed or missing. 
With American involvement in the war entering the third year, the plaque placed in the lobby of Seminary Hall already contained 21 names. A similar plaque listed the names of Bagley students killed or missing, Bagley Hall, which is the College of Ed. As World War II approached its end, in the spring of 1945, Ruth Allison, chairman of the War Service Committee, began to calculate the cost. The Northeastern Professor of Art had sent letters and cards to the parents of more than 3,000 alumni and former students in an attempt to locate everyone associated with the college and the military. Those who replied provided her with the names of more than 1,200 who were or had been in the military serving in almost every theater of war. Chief Oskin, because of our history with the Cherokee Nation, there's, this institution has had a disproportionately higher number of folks that respond when the nation calls. We note that she also discovered that 40, had those, 40 of those 1,200 had been reported killed or missing. More than a third of those died in aerial combat or aviation training accidents. Eight members of the Northeastern faculty and staff served during World War II. Because of the number of veterans at NSU in the fall 1946, Joe Roy, a Northeastern graduate, was employed on a part-time basis to assist to counsel former servicemen. NSU hired its first full-time person to help veterans uh, in, later in that same semester when they hired N.N. Duncan. N.N. Duncan served NSU in the veterans program from 1946 until his retirement in 1964, quickly to Vietnam. In 1965, Northeastern State College officials were informed by the state selective service system that increased draft calls because of Vietnam had required local draft boards to re-examine the policy of granting deferments to college students. Northeastern officials were asked to report to the local draft boards the name of registered students who did not complete a full course of study with satisfactory grades. At this stage in the nation's involvement in Vietnam, public opinion had not turned against further commitment. Only eight Northeastern State College students had been drafted and 14 had withdrawn to enlist in the military. That number rose quickly. By the end of the fall semester 1965, 30 students had left the school to enlist and 23 had been drafted. In the fall, the Northeastern, which is the school newspaper, polled the students on their views of the war. Of those who participated, there were 1,037. 957 supported the war effort. In fact, many favored great, greater commitment and greater involvement. As the war in Vietnam intensified, students at Northeastern began to take more notice and the war became a little more personal when students read in the Northeastern that a former NSU student, James R. Smith, had been killed in action on September 10th, 1967. The students, faculty, and staff of Northeastern State University have always responded when our nation called. I've shared a brief history of our response to call to arms in World War I, World War II, and Vietnam. However, we are keenly aware and grateful to all of those who've served in other wars and conflicts across the globe. We're pleased today that close to 300 veterans and their, or their family members are enrolled at NSU. Based on this partial history of military involvement, it is fitting that NSU dedicate a permanent and visual way to say thank you to veterans from the past, present, and future. It is now my honor to introduce the Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation, Chuck Hoskin, Jr. He was selected to serve the citizens of the Cherokee Nation in 2019. Prior to being elected Principal Chief, he served as the Cherokee Nation Secretary of State. As chief, he's focused on the Cherokee language, housing, healthcare, education, and sovereignty protection. 
He formerly served as a member of the Council of the Cherokee Nation, representing District 11 for six years, and he served his final two years as Deputy Speaker. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming a great friend to NSU, a huge supporter of all veterans, Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin, Jr. Chief, and Chief, as you're coming, thank you for providing the lead gift to make this monument possible. Thank you. Ms. President, uh, dear friends throughout the community, throughout the state, throughout the region, and particularly the veterans that are here with us today, OCO on behalf of the Cherokee Nation, and to the veterans, let me say thank you, Wado, for your service to this country. The Cherokee people have, across three centuries now, fought with or alongside the United States in its wars, in its efforts to protect freedom, to secure peace here and around the world. In fact, in modern times, Cherokee people have served at a disproportionate number to our population in the country. We've served during times, volunteered during times that were in the shadows of some great difficulties in this country between the United States and the Cherokee Nation in World War I, just a couple of generations removed from our forced removal did Cherokee people sign up to fight on behalf of the United States. That was before all Native Americans were even citizens of this country. In World War II, people like my grandfather volunteered to serve. You can go throughout the different conflicts the United States has had. You can see so many occasions in which Cherokee people have fought, fought bravely, or been willing to provide that sacrifice. I think it says something about the Cherokee people, but I think it says something also about this country and the reasons that people would serve and the reason they would be willing to give that sacrifice because this country on her best day stands for freedom and peace and it is the most powerful symbol, institution, country on the face of this planet for those great values and the Cherokee people know it, we value it too. And so it's with thank you. and so that is the primary reason among many that I'm proud to stand here today representing Cherokee Nation on this great campus with our great friends Northeastern State University I also particularly like this monument there is a time and a place in this country for monuments that memorialize and even glorify individuals, even military people who have distinguished themselves. As you see this monument, you'll see that it's not memorializing a single person who proved themselves in the field of battle. It is memorializing and depicting many people, a collective of people who have fought for this country in different branches from different walks of life. It's a reminder of something important that I think, particularly now in this country, we ought to think a bit more about. That as much division as there is from time to time, whether it's in this community, whether it's in this tribal nation, whether it's in this state, this region, this country, even though there's division and there always will be among free people, there are values around which we can and should rally. And when people come to this monument, they will be filled, I think, with a sense of pride and an opportunity to reflect not on an individual military hero, but on the collective effort to protect freedom and secure peace. The idea that for all the things that might divide us from time to time, that there are things that free people around this world value. And that is peace, and that is freedom. As long as this country, and I think it always will, 
stands for those values the Cherokee people will stand with this country. We're proud Americans. This monument is an opportunity for us on this beautiful campus to remind ourselves that there's so much more that unites us than divides us. And two of those things are peace and freedom for which the people reflected here fought and sometimes died for. Thank you very much, Widow. Thank you, Chief Hoskin. Great job. It's now my pleasure to introduce the chair of our governing board, the Regional University System of Oklahoma, an educator, a lover of higher education, an administrator, a good friend to all the Russo schools, Chair Regent Connie Riley. Thank you, Regent Riley. Good morning, and thank you to everyone for being here today to honor the men and women who have served this great country. It is exciting to be here to see this new monument and to share all that it represents with everyone here. It's great to be at NSU. Northeastern State University is an institution that has been recognized as a military-friendly campus. It is also a veterans employer champion and it is also a proud part of the United States Department of Defense's Yellow Ribbon Campaign. So I'm very proud of NSU. Along with NSU, all of our six universities are proud to serve the veterans and their families along their educational journey. On behalf of the regents of the Regional University System of Oklahoma, we are proud to be able to serve you and we are dedicated to giving back a little bit of the uh, huge amount you have given to us. Thank you. It is also my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce our new chancellor today. Chancellor from, is the, from the chancellor for the Oklahoma System of Higher Education. This is her first week on the job, so we are excited to have you here and you are giving us an exciting start to this wonderful event. Uh, Dr. Allison Garrett is a lifelong educator. She has served in many higher education institutions, including the Vice President for Abilene Christian University and her latest state as being the President of Emporia State University. She is one who honors education, the value of education, and how it can help everyone in our workforce, in our heroes, and in the veterans that we are honoring today. Dr. Allison is a trailblazer within herself. She is the first woman to ever serve the great state of Oklahoma as a chancellor. It is my distinct honor and please help me in welcoming to the state our new chancellor. We would like to welcome you to not only Northeastern State University, but to the great state of Oklahoma. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, and it truly is an honor to be here. I moved back to Oklahoma one week ago from Emporia, Kansas, and Emporia, Kansas is the founding city of Veterans Day, so it seems particularly appropriate that my first on-campus event would be here at Northeastern State, helping to dedicate this wonderful memorial. You know, toward the end of the Civil War, as uh, President Lincoln was giving the Gettysburg Address, he said, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, and I'll add, and women, living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. This wonderful memorial here on the campus of Northeastern State is a tribute to all of those who have served, many of whom have given their lives to support the values of this country. We're so proud of Northeastern State and all of those who have served. I want to take just a moment as well to thank President Turner for inviting me here today. Steve and I have been uh, friends for many years and uh, 
He was actually a faculty member who taught me many years ago, and uh, I'm grateful to him for his friendship through these years. President Turner, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm proud to represent the Oklahoma State Regents for Higher Education. We have a number of programs that help support veterans and their families. And I know that all of our institutions do as well. And so thank you for this beautiful tribute to those who have served, are serving, or will serve in the armed forces. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Riley and Chancellor Garrett for your remarks. I'm so inspired by all of the remarks today. Thank you to our speakers. I'd also like to welcome a guest. Um, Luke Holland from Senator Inhofe's office has joined us today. Luke, welcome. There you are back there. We're so, so pleased you could join us. It is indeed a pleasure to be here, to be um, provost of NSU, but also to serve as a veteran. I appreciate uh, President Turner's remarks. Certainly my time uh, in the Marine Corps was uh, something I will always remember. Uh, I, I visited a variety of places, experienced cultures diverse from my own, and uh, that is our lifelong memories, lifelong friends. But being at an institution and being part of the Russo that is also all of our sister institutions that have military friendly campuses is very important to me because what has changed the direction of my life was being able to obtain a degree. It's still very important. So I'm proud of all of us that are working together in this great state to make the pathways clear and helpful to our veterans. At this time, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, John Harrison who is a Brigadier General assigned to the Oklahoma National Guard. He was commissioned in 1988 through NSU's Reserve Officer Training Corps. Brigadier General Harrison has served our country for more than 30 years and is currently the Director of Joint Staff, where he has oversight of over 1,000 full-time employees. During his career, General Harrison served with units in the United States, Germany, and Iraq, and as commander of the company and at the battalion levels. He's been decorated with multiple awards, including the Legion of Merit and the Bronze Star. In addition to his baccalaureate degree in accounting from Northeastern State University, General Harrison holds a Master of Business Administration and Human Resource Management from Trident University International and a Master of Strategic Studies from the United States Army War College. In the fall of 2019, he was recognized with the President's Award for Community Service. Please join me in welcoming Brigadier General John Harrison. Well, how's everybody doing out there? I've got a lot of people standing around. If we were in a formation, I'd probably say, at ease, shake it out, move around a little bit, get some of that blood moving around. So Dr. Landry, thank you for that warm welcome. Usually I, I'd like to just go with, hey, this is John from Oklahoma, but I will take what you said. Linda and I were mentioning on the way up here that we had forgotten how beautiful it is in Tahlequah, Oklahoma in the fall, and certainly how beautiful it is here on the campus of NSU. And we are both honored to be here today. So Linda is also an alumnus of NSU and graduated magna cum laude, unlike myself, who graduated by the skin of my teeth. The two of us have been together pretty much our whole lives, and you would be hard pressed to find a bigger supporter of our veterans than Linda. So Linda, please stand up for just a minute and let everybody see you. <laughs> Dr. Turner, thank you again for the opportunity to speak today, and thank you for your strong leadership in making Northeastern State University a veteran-friendly university. Chief Hoskins, Regent Riley, Chancellor Garrett, it is an honor to share the stage with you today. Distinguished guests, members of our military forces, veterans and guests, 
Today, there is no more appropriate place to celebrate Veterans Day than here at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah, as we are about to dedicate NSU's new Veterans Monument and Plaza designed by Joe Randall. But most importantly, we gather to convey our nation's gratitude for those who risk their lives for the land, the people, and the ideals they love. As Dr. Turner said, 103 years ago, at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of the year 1918, the guns fell silent and the First World War drew to an end. A year later, President Wilson would proclaim November 11, 1919 as the first commemoration of Armistice Day. The original concept for Armistice Day, which we now call Veterans Day, was for a day observed with parades and public messages and a brief suspension of business beginning at 11 a.m. on November the 11th to honor veterans of World War I. The federal holiday we recognize today was approved by Congress in 1938, but it wasn't until 1954, following World War II and the Korean War, that Congress replaced armistice with veterans, amending the original act to commemorate November 11th as a day in America when veterans of all wars are honored. So today, here in Tahlequah, we come together to honor and recognize all of our American service members, past and present, and salute you for your service to our country, both in uniform and out. We remember the brave men and women who served in places like Cowpens, Antietam, Gettysburg, and San Juan Hill, in the trenches of France, the Argonne Forest, Anzio, Rome, the beaches of Normandy, the deserts of Africa, the jungles of the Philippines, Guam, Okinawa, and Vietnam, the hills of Korea, and those who stood ready through the Cold War years, the sands of Kuwait, and the villages of Iraq, and the mountains of Afghanistan. And, so we, and since we are here in the capital of the Cherokee Nation, it is only fitting to note that Native Americans serve in the armed forces at five times the national average and have served with distinction in every major conflict for over 200 years. We remember those veterans that came before us, veterans like PFC Charles George, who was also a Cherokee and a member of Oklahoma's own 45th Division. On November 29, 1952, near Songnedong, Korea, PFC George made a split-second decision to throw himself on a grenade to shield his comrades. George suffered from his wounds silently to protect his company, and he passed away the next day. For his bravery, during the last hours of his life, George was awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously in 1954. Boatswain's mate, first class James Williams, who also was Cherokee, was awarded the Medal of Honor for action on October 31st, 1966 on the Mekong River, Republic of Vietnam. While serving as a boat captain and patrol officer aboard a river patrol boat accompanied by another patrol boat when the patrol was suddenly taken under fire by two enemy sampans. With utter disregard for his safety, Williams exposed himself to a hail of enemy fire and direct counterfire and inspired the actions of his patrol. By the end of what would become a three-hour battle, the patrol accounted for the destruction or loss of 65 boats and infected numerous casualties, correction, inflicted numerous casualties on the enemy personnel. And right here in Oklahoma, in just a few weeks, on December 5th, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Colony, a member of the Oklahoma National Guard's 138th Fighter Wing stationed in Tulsa, will be awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for an F-16 close air support mission flown April 30th, 2018, while deployed to Bagram Air Base. Many lives on the ground were saved that day as a result of his actions and airborne leadership. By the way, he is a third generation pilot and a third generation guardsman, as his grandfather, William Gordon Colony, flew fighters in World War II, and his father, Eric Colony, flew F-4s and F-5s. We will always remember those who gave all and those who came before us. But most importantly, 
on this and every Veterans Day, we want to thank those veterans that are with us today. Those who, have, those who were sent into battle and those who trained hard and stood ready for the call. It is important that we spend this day rejoicing in your service and remembering that because of you, our veterans, this country still stands. So if you're a veteran, please stand as you are able or give us a wave so we can recognize your willingness to serve, your dedicated service, and the sacrifices that come with that service. <laughs> Family members of these veterans, would you stand as you are able or give us a big wave so that we can thank you for your support to your veteran. <laughs> to paraphrase a quote from a former chief of staff of the Army, and I changed it just a bit, the strength of our nation is our military, and the strength of our military is our service members, and the strength of our service members is our families, and that is what makes us so strong. Now I know Dr. Turner, the cabinet, all of the professors and the staff work hard at inspiring our next generation, and they work every day to mold the students of this great university into aspiring, thoughtful, and capable citizens. In that same spirit, veterans, we play a vital role in inspiring the next generation. One way to do this is to share the stories of those who came before us, like the Native American Code Talkers, or Medal of Honor winners, correction, recipients. But the most important thing you can pass on is your story, why you chose to serve, how the military influenced and contributed to your life, Every one of us has a story, or maybe several, to pass on. It may be as simple as a young kid from Purcell, Oklahoma, who enlisted in the Oklahoma Army National Guard because he had a dream to become a pilot, who married his high school sweetheart, who went on to become a master avi Army aviator, serving in Germany and Iraq and Korea, who decided to come back to Oklahoma with Linda to raise their family, and continued to serve the Oklahoma National Guard training across the globe, and serving again in Iraq. The Army taught me a good work ethic, to remain calm when all around you may not be. It taught me values, and it allowed Linda and I to raise our two children, put them through college, and watch them leave the nest as productive citizens. It is your stories, your experiences, that will inspire young people to serve in the United States military or to serve the country in some other capacity. This inspiration will ensure the United States of America and our military will not only survive, but will thrive as we continue to move through the 21st century and beyond. I would like to close with a poem by Andrea Christensen Brett. As I read through the poem, veterans, be thinking of your personal story and how you can share it with our youth. I am a veteran by Andrea Christensen Brett. You may not know me the first time we meet. I'm just another you see on the street. But I am the reason you walk and breathe free. I am the reason for your liberty. I am a veteran. I work in the local factory all day. I own the pawn shop just down the way. I sell your insurance. I start your IV. I've got the best looking grandkids you'll ever see. I'm your grocer, your banker, your child's school teacher. I'm your plumber, your barber, your family's preacher. But there's a part of me you don't know very well. Just listen a moment. I've got a story to tell. I am a veteran. I joined the service while still in my teens. I traded my prom dress for camouflage greens. I'm the first in my family to do something like this. I followed my father like he followed his. Defying my fears and hiding my doubt, I married my sweetheart before I shipped out. I missed Christmas, then Easter, the birth of my son, but I knew I was doing what had to be done. I served on the battlefront, I served on the base. I bound up the wounded and begged for God's grace. I gave orders to fire, I followed commands. 
I marched into conflict in far distant lands. In the jungle, the desert, on mountains and shores, in bunkers and tents on dank earthen floors. While I fought on the ground, in the air, on the sea, my family and friends were home praying for me. For the land of the free and the home of the brave, I faced my demons in foxholes and caves. Then one dreaded day without drummer or fife, I lost my arm. My friend lost his life. I came home and moved on, but forever was changed. The perils of war in my memory remained. I don't really say much, I don't feel like I can. But I left home a child, and I came home a man. There are thousands like me, thousands more who are gone, but their legacy lives as time marches on. White crosses in rows and names carved in queue remind us of what these brave souls had to do. I'm a part of a fellowship, a strong, mighty band of each man and each woman who has served this great land. And when old glory waves, I stand proud, I stand tall. I helped keep her flying over you, over all. I am a veteran. <clears throat> well, ladies and gentlemen, it's been my pleasure to share Veterans Day with you today. Please remember our soldiers and airmen, sailors, Marines, and Coasties currently serving here in Oklahoma, across the country and overseas, many of them still in harm's way, standing up for freedom and democracy. Thank you, and have a wonderful Veterans Day. Thank you, General Harrison. At, we're getting very close to an exciting part of our ceremony today. I want to tell you just a little bit about Joel Randall. But before that, how we got to where we are today. In August of 2018, the Veteran Monument Committee released a request for proposals to interested artists to design a statue guided by the theme, NSU Veterans, serving and communicating throughout the decades. 11 artists responded, and interviews were conducted with the top three. Ultimately, the concept submitted by Joel Randall was recommended by the committee for approval to the cabinet. Joel is with us today to unveil and describe his creation. I will say more about Mr. Randall in a moment. Uh, the committee was also tasked with selecting the location for the Veterans Monument statue. They considered four locations around the Tahlequah campus. They unanimously selected this site between the historic Seminary Hall and the Center for Performing Arts. In addition, the committee provided guidance on the key elements of the plaza that surround the monument. It is now my privilege to introduce Mr. Joel Randall. While earning a degree in art education, Joel began a traditional sculptor's apprentice role when an established sculptor, Sean Gray, asked Joel to help with a large bronze sculpture project. Over the past 20 years, Joel has worked on several larger-than-life bronze sculpture pro projects, including a veterans monument in Dell City, consisting of seven statues depicting women from all branches of the U.S. Armed Forces and National Guard. Joel has been an outstanding partner to work with. Mr. Randall, if you would come forward at this time. Thank you, Dr. Landry. What a beautiful day. We love our veterans, don't we? We sure do. Yes, let's give them a hand one more time. Up front, I would like to express my appreciation to the scores of hardworking individuals who labored diligently to make this monument a reality. President Turner caught the vision for a veterans monument and shared it with the rest of us and really shared it and is now sharing it with the world. And I've had the pleasure of working with the committee to make certain 
this monument was as inclusive and as successful as possible. And man, the committee, they have just been great. And this site, I can't imagine a better site. It's just beautiful. Everyone here at NSU is outstanding. And then there are the generous donors and the architects and the construction professionals, my foundry, the bronze horse and the crucible. Um, I was thinking about it and I thought, you know, uh, to name everyone, it would be a little bit like uh, reading the credits at the end of a movie, right? Because there's so many people involved in making such a, an incredible project like, like this come to life. So thank you. You have made history with your contribution. Our time and efforts are never wasted when we recognize and honor our veterans and the men and women currently serving in the armed forces. My father served in the Army. He was a sergeant. He's here uh, today. And I've always enjoyed hearing him and so many others speak of their time and experiences in the military. Sharing those powerful, har harrowing stories provides a lot of inf inspiration for me as an artist. As a classically trained figure in portrait sculpture, sculptor, I specialize in sculpting people like veterans in honorific fashion. These bronze representations tell the story of worthy individuals who left their mark on society and deserve to be remembered. But perhaps my favorite subject matter in this vein is historical military sculpture. It's always been significant in my mind. As a child, I loved to study military history. When I was in the fourth grade, I distinctly remember the first time I saw a bronze statue. My father, who's a minister, used to take me with him to visit sick parishioners in regional hospitals. And I would, you know, wait in the, in the lobby or the waiting room. And one of these places was the Muskogee Veterans Hospital, not too far from here. And while walking in as a child, I noticed this interesting figure out front. You know, what is this thing? It was a life-size bronze statue of a World War I doughboy soldier, sculpted in an action pose with all of his gear. Now, that sculpture is still there. I saw it a couple of years ago when I was in Muskogee. I made a point to go see it. But I remember standing there in awe as I just tried to take it all in, this, this sculpture of this, this soldier. There was the uniform, the gun, the helmet, his face, his hands. It all looked so real and so intricate. And I remember thinking, wow, how did the artist create this work with such exacting detail? I was utterly amazed. So what did I do? I asked my parents to buy me some clay so I could try to replicate this unique art form. And I want to say thank God for supportive parents. They took me straight to a local hobby store there in Muskogee and bought me some modeling clay. I believe we lived in Okmulgee at the time. Now I wish I could say that I was this amazing child prodigy in my first effort at sculpting a small soldier but honestly, I don't, even, I don't even remember how it turned out, but that was my first introduction to sculpting and sculpture. So now, years later, I've been blessed with this wonderful opportunity to sculpt one of my own World War I bronze doughboys who is depicted as a Cherokee coat talker. It doesn't get any better than that, not for me. And in the same neck of the woods as the sculpture that inspired me so much uh, on that day when I saw my first sculpture. Now my hope is that this monument will likewise inspire young men and women to also serve and communicate down through the ages to come uh, to serve their country in the military. 
There are six human figures in this patriotic composition, and I was tasked by the committee to represent each branch of the military during certain periods of war, each expressing some form of communication. Now, I won't go through all, uh, all six of them here right now because that information is in your, uh, in your uh, handout, but I do want to look at a couple of them. Our typical five branches are represented and listed with raised lettering under each, but there are two others also included besides the five that go around the Pentagon. And one, uh, one of these is a sixth new branch of service and a female figure who represents the home front. Now this lady holding an American flag stands on the United States facing east with her right foot on Oklahoma and, and, and more specifically this Tahlequah. She represents those on the home front waiting patiently for their loved one's safe return while holding high the lantern that lights the way back. And I want to uh, also mention that our lantern here is actually lit. And that's a bit of a rarity. Very few uh, sculptures, bronze sculptures that I know of are actually having type of internal lighting. At the top of the flag is a symbol of our newest branch. And this is something we included a little bit later on. Uh, Space Force, and it is aptly placed high on the sculpture as if it were a defense communication satellite. So we have all six branches, and I think that's also pretty unique for a veteran's monument. We may be the first, who knows? But in conclusion, may we, as one people, be worthy of those who sacrifice and serve to protect our freedoms, and may, be, may we be worthy of God's blessing. Thank you. And gentlemen, if you would come on over and uh, go ahead and begin the unveiling process. I think the wind helped us out a little bit earlier, and maybe we get a, another assist here. indeed beautiful. Thank you, Joel.